Good evening. In life, there is one certainty, and that is that it ends. Fear of dying is a fear of the unknown, of taking a journey into uncharted waters. But is it a leap into the abyss? There are people who claim to have glimpsed what lies beyond. They're not psychics or mystics, but normal, everyday people who've had what is known as a near-death experience. It was so brilliant. The feeling of love, joy, knowledge, superb. And off we went. The fact that it seemed likely that I was going to die in a strange country, away from a family and friends, was totally unimportant. In some ways, it was a rather wonderful experience because it brought about such an enormous transformation in my life. I felt some peace and contentment. I seemed happy after all the, the noise and the explosions and the flames and the sparks I'd gone through. It's, it was so peaceful. The near-death experience is a phenomenon that has been widely recognized for many centuries. When people who've been on the brink of death recover, they report remarkably similar experiences. Neuropsychiatrist Dr. Peter Fennick is Britain's leading clinical authority on the subject. I've studied over 400 cases, but at the moment I can't see a satisfactory scientific explanation which really explains the data. At the age of 17, David Whitmarsh was in the Navy, serving on a frigate in the Far East. Part of my duties was testing sockets. All of a sudden, big flash like an explosion in my mind and my brain. And I realized that I'd taken the full 415 volts. David then entered a state which had all the classic features of the near-death experience. You become very frightened, and then suddenly you're transfused by calmness. And then you start to lose consciousness. I felt <laughs> myself in a beautiful darkness. It was lovely, peaceful. I began to go down, down, down a tunnel. The tunnel you usually float down, it's black. Then you see a speck of light at the end, and you float towards the speck of light, get bigger and bigger, and as you enter it, you enter into a feeling of universal love and compassion. I found myself standing in this beautiful yellow cornfield, and I appeared to be wearing a blue gown. And then I saw from the corner of my eye what appeared to be a train on the horizon. But then I felt myself go, going towards the train, moving towards it as though I was zooming into it. There seemed to be figures in the train. I couldn't see their features. They were misty, shadowy. And they appeared to be beckoning. And all of a sudden, I was in the train. I was sat there with them. It was just a babble of excitement, happiness, contentment. And then my happiness appeared to be shattered. I felt a pressure on my shoulders. I couldn't understand what was happening. I wanted to stay here. And for some strange reason, I felt myself going up, yet I was being pushed down. Within what appeared a few seconds, I was back on the deck of the ship again. I was so angry. I just. I just didn't want to leave. I just wanted to go back. What baffles scientists is that David Whitmarsh, like many others, has a precise memory of his near-death experience, even though he was unconscious. An unconscious state is when the brain ceases to function. For example, if you faint, you fall to the floor, you don't know what's happening, and the brain isn't working. The memory systems are particularly sensitive to unconsciousness, so you won't remember anything. But yet, after one of these experiences, people come out with clear, lucid memories. It was so clear, concise. It wasn't mixed up like a dream or an hallucination could be. It was the same as I'm talking now. Now, this is a real puzzle for science, and I have not yet seen 
any good scientific explanation which can explain that fact. One theory is that the near-death experience is simply a function of anoxia, the condition when the brain is starved of oxygen. Alan Pring is a former Royal Air Force pilot who knows what it's like to be without oxygen. I was rather stupid and I went far too high without oxygen. You get lightheaded, euphoric and nothing seems terribly important. But Alan has also had a near-death experience which he recalls with absolute clarity. He insists it's quite distinct from the mental confusion of oxygen deprivation. It's there, like no other memory. It began during a routine operation. I knew that I was dead. I wasn't bothered. And I felt as if I was waiting for something to happen. And it did. In a flash, the whole of my life passed before me. Everything that I'd ever done, ever thought, ever said, was there. And I floated off through this darkness and drifted down into a, a, a large, very large room. And in each corner, there was a figure. They all seemed to have like a monk's cowl, and they all had their faces turned away from me. And then they started to ask me questions. What do you regret about your life? I suppose the times I've hurt people. What is the most important thing you've learned? To be wise, with humility. Alan Pring found himself being judged, a familiar feature of the near-death experience. It's very moral and very judgmental, and but the person who's judging is you. You judge yourself, and all those nasty little grubby things you've done, you don't like very much. And now I was in a place that uh, words cannot describe. Just a wonderful aurora of, 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 of light all embracing love, compassion, knowledge, was pouring in. What happened next was the worst moment that I'd ever know. I realized I couldn't go on. I had to turn around and come back. The reason I had to come back was, or that I felt, was that I was very much in love with my wife. And I wanted to be able to tell her that she can't die. It's impossible to die. So what accounts for Alan Pring's visions of a possible afterlife if it's not a lack of oxygen? Drugs, whether taken medicinally or recreationally, often lead to similar states. Could this be the answer? The difficulty with those theories is that when you create these wonderful states by taking drugs, you're conscious. In the near-death experience, you're unconscious. And one of the things we know about brain function in unconsciousness is that you cannot create images, and if you do, you cannot remember them. Drugs certainly had no part to play in the experience of psychologist Margot Gray. On holiday in India in 1982, she caught typhoid and felt her life ebbing away. I found myself out of my body and I was very surprised, um, you know, how ill I looked, but I felt totally detached from the whole experience. Margot's experience was not immediately one of joy and peace. She first faced a battle with death itself. It was a young girl who looked very familiar. In a curious kind of way, it was rather like a doppelganger experience. It was rather like looking at myself at that age. And I looked on the other side of the pool and I could see this dark, murky patch on the bottom of the pool. And I knew that it was a dead body without get being told. And I didn't want to go over, but somehow I was compelled. 
It came up from the bottom and grabbed me in a vice-like grip and started dragging me down. And just as I felt I couldn't hold on any longer, I did actually, just my head came out of the water. And with my free arm, I said to it, oh, no, you don't. I said, you have no power over me. I'm stronger than you are. And with that, it let go. And at that moment, I found myself back in my body and in my bed. But the extraordinary thing was, at that moment, the temperature broke. And after that, I started to make really quite a speedy recovery. I think the interesting point about the near-death experience is that it tends to make you more moral. In other words, more concerned for other people, less concerned for yourself. And of course, most importantly, it takes away the fear of death. I think the most important thing it taught me is not to be afraid of life. And once you cease to be afraid of life, then the whole quality of life changes. I'm not afraid, not afraid anymore of death. I know where I'm gonna go now. If it is the same as it I've been through, then I should be very happy. But I truly believe that the world would be a better place if more people had had the experience than I had and they considered the possibility that death is not the end and that existence, consciousness or whatever goes on. Dylan Thomas eloquently described fear of death when he wrote, do not go gentle into that good night. Old age should burn and rave at close of day. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. Well, whatever actually happened to our witnesses in near-death encounters, they now have no fear of the dying of the light. In part two, the hoax aboard a World War II bomber that takes a chilling twist. Just another school choir photograph. At least it would be if it weren't for this mysterious gate crasher. The children are from St Hugh's School in Woodhall Spa, the Lincolnshire village once home of 617 Danbuster Squadron. They were marking the laying of a memorial to the airmen who died during the mission to bomb the Ruhr Valley Dans. No one knew who the dog was or how he got there. Some say he was the ghost of Wing Commander Guy Gibson's Black Labrador, the squadron's mascot. It's not the only strange story linked to wartime bombing missions. Tonight, we visit Cosford in Shropshire to consider just such a mystery. The brooding presence of the Lincoln B-2, the last of the Second World War bombers. In the 1970s, this plane was the focus for an elaborate and highly successful hoax. But the prank had a bizarre twist. Nearly 20 years ago, a team of engineers arrived at Cosford Aerospace Museum to carry out restoration on the bomber, number RF-398. Before completing their work, they were told the plane was to be transferred to a new museum opening in Manchester. The star of the, the museum should always remain there. And when we found out she was on the uh, movement role to go to Manchester, we were literally horrified. We wanted 398 to stay at Cosford. Yeah, all right. The engineering team came up with the plan to prevent the bomber being transferred. Right, what are we going to call it then? Don't know, what about uh, Pete the Poltergeist? How often does it come around? Once a week, once a day, what? Well, I think he's here now. I can feel him. <laughs> we actually invented uh, a ghost on the aircraft, and the more people that came to see the aircraft at Cosford, the more chance the aircraft actually had at staying here. Hello. Hello. I'm Carol Hardy. I'm from the Gazette. I spoke to Jim about the plane. Oh, that's right. Hello. What's been happening then? Well, I wouldn't believe it. It's been extraordinary. Once the, the local newspaper got in on the scene, we then had local radio. Uh, the joke as we saw it actually got out of control. Hey, Jim. Well, you never guess what's happened. The local vicar's been on the phone. He's only offered to exorcise the place. Oh, we can't get rid of Pete now. Oh, no. I just signed him up for the union. <laughs> Well, it was about 1980 or 1981 where we were informed that the Lincoln would be staying at Cosford. And as such, our task with the funny ghost was completed. The, the hooking ceased because there was no need. We had saved the aircraft. Today, the plane remains at Cosford. Of course, we've discovered now that the so-called hauntings were a hoax, but there is something we can't account for. The plane has become the centre of a new mystery. 
For nine years, paranormal researcher Ivan Spensley has been investigating a series of unexpectedly strange noises in the bomber. I decided to do some sound recording, so I placed a microphone near the radio operator's position and set the machine running, and the hangar was evacuated. Ivan returned to the hangar and played back the tape. He was staggered by what he heard. This is his actual recording from the empty plane in the deserted hangar. The first recordings I made here, I didn't know whether it was the sound of the hangar changing as, as the heat of the day left the building. I really wasn't sure, and I didn't know what to make of them. What I needed to do was do some more recording and also observe the, the natural ambience of the hangar. During his many visits to Cosford, Ivan has always meticulously ensured that nothing can contaminate his recordings. I seal all the outer doors with a strip of paper which I sign and if that paper's broken then I know somebody has gained entry. But since I've been doing it, I've never found any broken seals. To ensure the sounds aren't caused by faulty equipment, Ivan uses several different recorders and microphones. When the time came to publicise his findings, he invited Radio 4 producer Gwyn Richards to join him for an all-night vigil on board. It was about half past midnight, and we'd been sitting there for some time. I looked down to the rear gunner's compartment, and I thought I saw a pinprick of light. And I nudged Ivan and said, Can you see what I can see? And uh, he said, Yes. And, uh, this tiny pinprick of light by this time seemed to have been getting nearer and it was moving slightly from one side to the other. And we looked at each other and uh, we thought, well, we did see it. After making a radio programme about his experiences on board the plane, Gwyn received a sackful of letters. I mean, there is no explanation, really, uh, but one letter only at the end gave me something which I thought was possible. It said that when the crew was on night flying, they used to reverse the little concave reflector in their torches and cover the bulb with them so that only a tiny pinprick of light was emitted from the torch in order to save the pilot's night vision. And that seems to me to be something which uh, approximates what I saw. But what about the noises? Ivan and Gwyn made further recordings on that occasion. I didn't expect to hear anything. And then suddenly on the tape was this incredible bang. I said, my God, I play that again. And he fooled it back, played it again. Well, this is absolutely ridiculous. I just don't believe it, but it's there. Also on the tape was a sound that Ivan's recorders had not picked up before. This is the actual sound. Could the tape simply have picked up radio signals from atmospheric interference? I wanted those sounds verified by somebody who might know what, what caused them. Which was the worst part, landing or takeoff? <laughs> from my point of view, landing. <laughs> Ivan contacted the former 398 crew, among them pilot Phil Pritchett and navigator Gary Lewis. We climbed aboard and took up our positions. I was a pilot, so I took the captain's seat. Gary was up in the nose in the navigator seat, and we went through all the drills that we have to do before we start flying. The noises we heard on the tape, they, they certainly sounded like the normal noises that we get on an aeroplane, but somewhat modified. The noises on the tape resembled the clicks made by the switches during the cockpit drills. As for the whistling sound, Gary has his own theory. Eventually we worked out that it was a navigation aid called console. This surprised us because, the, as far as we knew, the navigation aid had been out of service for about 25 or 30 years. I thought it was very strange to 
get these noises in the middle of the night, hangar doors locked, nobody on the aeroplane, just tapes recording. Very strange indeed. The last console navigation unit was decommissioned in 1956. Thinking about it since then, I, I still can't find any logical explanation. It just defeats me completely. But could the recording simply be the sound of the hangar contracting as it cools down at night? The roof of the hangar creaking and that kind of thing. It's an easily distinguishable sound. It can't be mixed up with anything else. So what do the original hoaxers make of the strange noises Ivan has recorded? There are noises which may need further investigation, but there is probably a logical um, answer to those noises. But what that is, I don't know. I've listened very carefully to the noises I've recorded on that plane. I've tried to find natural causes for those noises. After nine years, I haven't been able to do so. But Ivan does know of one theory linked to the plane's history. The story on record here at Cosford is that RF-398 was flown by master pilot Hiller on its final flight. It said that he liked the plane so much that he would haunt it when he died. The strange thing is that Hiller was taken off Lincoln bombers and transferred to a Dove aircraft which crashed not too far away from Cosford and he was killed. The other thing is that part of that crashed aircraft was brought back and housed at Cosford. When we tried to trace the operational history of the bomber, we found gaps in some of the plane's official records. One explanation, it's believed to have flown on secret missions. Altogether, it seems there are more questions than answers about RF-398. Good night. <laughs>